This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be talking to a pioneer of the rock and roll magazine medium, and I am talking about Ann Moses, and she started working for them when she was only like 18 years old, Tiger Beat Magazine, and she got to know everyone from The Who to Paul Revere and the Raiders, to the Monkees, to the Partridge family, so many people. And we're going to talk about all of that stuff today. Uh, she has a memoir out called Meow, My uh, Groovy Life with um, Tiger Beats Teen Idols. And um, it's going to be a great conversation. Like I said, she's a pioneer. I can't think of any other woman who was an editor for a magazine before that. I could be wrong, but... Right now, it belongs to Ann Moses, and I cannot wait to have this conversation with her today. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Ann Moses. Hey, Ann, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am just fantastic, and I cannot tell you what an honor this is. I consider you a pioneer, and I thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. Just took a, a break from my baking. <laughs> a little bit of pre-Thanksgiving baking? Oh, you know, I bake almost every day. It's my favorite hobby, and since I learned to cook uh, watching Julia Child's on PBS in the late 60s, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and now that I've retired, I get to do it whenever I want. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> love it. So, going back in time, long before Tiger Beat, did you gravitate toward journalism early on in your childhood? Well, I did, um, and more than anything, um, it was just a way to make money. Uh, you know, I had, you know, like every kid growing up in the 50s, I had done household chores to make money. But when I was in junior high, um, there, uh, the, uh, you know, I grew up in Anaheim, two miles from Disneyland. And the Anaheim Bulletin, which was a local daily paper, they had a teen page where you, and I became a reporter for my junior high. And mm -hmm. so... They would put in articles, you know, from different, in quotes, reporters from different schools that were all, you know, preteen and, and teenagers. Right. And, um, and I got paid 15 cents an inch. So needless <laughs> to say, that was the start of me writing as long, you know, embellishing my articles and writing long articles because it meant more money. <laughs> <laughs> you were always uh, asking questions and was fascinated with what was going on in the world. I was, and then and then in high school, I was involved in the yearbook, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, there's not much writing involved there, but it was a matter of me. It, it, that was kind of like the first magazine I ever put together because it was like I wanted to show all of the different things that happened in the school and so you know it it turned out that that was some good background experience for later on and then in junior college um i got involved with the school paper and became the co-editor in my second year right. and um and again i would do stories for the fashion page and story occasionally i'd interview a celebrity that would come to the school and perform, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it went, you know, it just led itself to, uh, doing my first interview with the Dave Clark Five at Melody Land, where I was a volunteer usher, and, uh, that was the start of my, you know, actual career in journalism. <laughs> that, did you love rock and roll early on? Uh, just like every other kid of my time, you know, I yeah. mean, first it was Hound Dog and Elvis and then, and then all the different 
you know, the wall of sound records started coming along and Motown and all those things. So just what every other kid was doing at the time, it really wasn't beyond that. But I, I had this distinct memory in my senior year of high school, that was 1964, and I think it was in, it, like November 63-ish that uh, uh, we had all been listening to, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. We'd all been listening to I Want to Hold Your Hand yeah. and Love Me Do. And then we saw a picture of what the Beatles actually looked like in Life magazine. And it was like, oh my gosh. I mean, this was this was so far beyond Bobby Rydell and Paul Anka and, and whoever else were the teenage faves of the time. And it was just like full steam ahead. I just... The whole British invasion sparked something in me that it was like, you know, when I met the Dave Clark Five and interviewed them, and, you know, I wasn't writing for anyone then. I I just put it in my college newspaper. But it's like there was just such an enchantment around the British. I mean, just the accent alone made them, you know, they were up on a pedestal compared to our artists of the time. Yeah. And, you know, that would, that would, of course, change as a lot of really good groups came along and everything. But just what was, and then there were the Beatles and the Stones, and that was just such a, um, you know, huge change in music. And it was just like, you know, being a part of this new thing that was brand new to everybody. So it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember your first album that you ever bought? Uh, actually, yeah, with my own money. I had, you know, saved up money washing windows at mom's house, mom and dad, mm-hmm. and cleaning out their garage for 25 cents. But anyway, I had saved up my money. Yeah. And I bought, I bought a Jan and Dean album. Oh, love it. I just talked to uh, Dean last year. Oh, yeah, they were they were awesome, and you know all that stuff was going around during my high school years. The, the surfing music. I mean, we were unique being in Anaheim because I mean we would go to the retail retail clerks union hall in Buena Park, which was right across the street from Knott's Berry Farm, and in those days Knott's Berry Farm was not this huge amusement park, it was pretty much just the old ghost town. And you could get in free, so it wasn't like later on Knott's Berry Farm. And, I mean, every Saturday night, the kids from from all the schools all around would go. And it's like groups like the Standells and the Beach Boys played there. And it's like we didn't even get excited about seeing the Beach Boys it was just that we loved dancing to their music. So, you know, there might have been a handful of girls. The stage wasn't very high. It was only like three feet high. Right. So there might have been a few girls up there, you know, digging on the group themselves. But we were just, we loved their music, and and we just spent the whole night dancing. So it was, the, it was just some really fun times, you know. And then yeah. about that time... So many groups started appearing at all what had been the folk coffee shops, co- excuse me, coffee houses. Right. All of a sudden, all the new groups are playing there, whether it was, you know, Elton John at the Troubadour or, you know. Yeah. Hello, Ann. Ann, hello? Yes? Oh, you disappeared for a moment. <laughs> oh, I, did. I don't know how that happened. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, do you remember your first uh, concert you went to? Was it Jen and Dean? Uh, let's see. No, no. And I didn't see them in concert until I was, you know, at... I was working at Melody Land because I love, you know, I was working at Disneyland, which, you know, I'm one of the 
original crew from 55, I think the, the original cast members were, you know, 55 to, I can't remember what year, but, mm-hmm. but I'm in that group. And I worked there, and then, but I still uh, was a volunteer usher at Melody Land so I could see all the musicals free, you know, the big musicals like Anna Get Your Gun and Camelot, and those kind of shows would come to the theater in the round, and that was right across the street from Disneyland. So after I'd done a shift to Disneyland, I went over to uh, Melody Land one night, and I really hadn't paid attention to who was even appearing by that time because I'd been doing it for a year. And it turned out it was the Dave Clark Five, the Astronauts, and this duo that I'd never heard of called Sonny and Cher. (laughs) And so literally, that was pretty much the first I'd ever, you know, seen any music group live. And, uh, Except with the exception of Joe and Eddie, they were a singing duo during that time, and they were they were really popular in Southern California. I don't know if they ever got popular beyond that, but yeah. uh, you know. And I was just standing there, and I mean, it was the Dave Clark Five, and girls were streaming, and you know, none of us had ever seen anything like that. Um, I'm not. I'm trying to think if that was the summer of '60. Summer of 65, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, summer of, summer of 65. So up until then, I hadn't seen any, any live shows. And uh, so it was, a, it was quite a revelation. When you went uh, backstage to uh, talk to the Dave Clark Five, um, what were they like? Oh, just, they were just, you know, like young men. They were, they were, boys, you know, with these fabulous accents. They were so nice. And, you know, this was so early in their career that they were just, it's like they seemed excited to, to be talking, you know, to this college girl for her college newspaper. They didn't care. It was, it was just all new to them. And they were just so sweet. And I would find out that that would turn out to be the the, the case with like most of the, the artists that I, I would come into contact with because it was just so new to them and they were, you know, unfiltered and, and you, you really got to know them as people because they, they really hadn't, you know, had the full impact of what their careers would become right. so early. And um, so... And, and it's just, it was such a unique thing to me. You know, I'd never spoken with someone with a British accent like that. And, of course, they were just so casual about it. And you, you just couldn't help but be enchanted. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Dave Clark was such a brilliant drummer, and he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. You know, the, I have to keep the volume low when I listen with headphones on because those drums hurt my ears, but they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Boy, did he pound on him, you know, in yeah. live appearances. But we hadn't seen anything like that, you know, maybe until Keith Moon came along. And, you know, and he was <laughs> yeah. like this one-man destruction kit. Uh, Man and, from another planet. <laughs> uh, it, it was, yes, yes. It was just everything you were seeing during those days was totally new. You know, it right. hadn't been on TV. It hadn't. It hadn't been, you know, anywhere that anyone had gone in the, in the very early days. And then, and, and to see the, the Beatles, I'm trying to think of the first year they came. I think the first year, well, it was whenever they appeared at the Hollywood Bowl, that was the first time I saw them. And I, I think it might have been, no, I don't, I can't remember, maybe 64, but anyway... I mean, those were, those were really, you know, turned out to be amazing times. When, so when you did that interview, did you, did you submit it to Tiger Beat and then you just got the job? No, actually, 
actually, I, I ran it in my college newspaper in the entertainment section, and um, all I got was flack from all my fellow newspaper journalists. Of course. It's like, now, why are you writing about that teeny bopper group, you know? You should be writing about a real artist like Bob Dylan. <laughs> and it's like, you know, whatever. And I ended up going with a couple of the guys from from the paper to see Bob Dylan uh, at Pasadena Civic. And, and I know that was before I went to work at Hollywood. And it was one of those nights where he played half the show on an acoustic guitar, and then he brought the electric guitar out. And, you know, everybody was all at Twitter because it's like so many people hadn't heard about that or hadn't seen him play the electric guitar. So it was quite controversial. But I thought it was quite groovy, you know, the, the whole show. And uh, and I agreed with the guys. I thought Bob Dylan was awesome, too. But that didn't, that didn't change my mind about, you know, the British invasion and all those those fabulous groups. But it would be, then the next time the Dave Clark Five came back into town, um, they let me know they were coming and, and then I, I went to a show with them in Long Beach, California, got trapped in the limousine with, with Dave Clark <laughs> and had the girls climbing on top and shaking the limo. So that was a new experience. But it was during that time that I was writing for a little music newspaper that was distributed in, in Orange County yeah. called Rhythm and News. And so I had written a story for Rhythm and News, but then one of the other girls that wrote for the paper, and of course there was no pay. You just, it was out of the, you know, the love of meeting the groups, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, well, wouldn't it be neat to get paid to do this? She said, I'd like to work for Tiger Beat. And I said, what's Tiger Beat? <laughs> and she said, well, it's this magazine, you know, about all the music people. And so I went and bought a copy of Tiger Beat. And, that, you know, at that point in time, they had their first issue was September of 1965. So there were probably only three issues out at that particular time. And... So uh, one of my habits was to always send a copy of whatever article I wrote to the group's manager or, the, or whoever I had interviewed, their PR person, so kind of to authenticate myself, to show them that, you know, they had arranged for me to have an interview or whatever, and look, here's my story and, and all that. So um, Derek Taylor was the publicist for... You know, he had been the publicist for the Beatles, but then he came over to the U.S. and he he was also a PR guy, and he yeah. he did uh, PR for like the Birds and everyone that was on the Dick uh, Dick Clark Caravan of Stars, and so I was in his office. He did an article I had written about one of his groups. I think it was the Beach Boys at the time. I had done an interview with them. And um, so, I, you know, I said, here's the article. I want to thank you for setting it up, blah, blah, blah. And I said, if any chance, you know, know the people at Tiger Beat? And he goes, yeah, I'm, I write a monthly column for them. And I said, wow, do you think you could give me an introduction? <laughs> you know, thinking, you know, the next time I saw him, maybe he would have inquired or something. And he goes, well, you know, it was a Friday. He said, let me just make a call. Editorial director, uh -huh. and he said, "You know this girl, introduce yourself, and, and you know she's real good writer. Whatever he said, you know, complimentary." Yeah. And and he and then then he held his hand over the the receiver, and he said, "Can you go over there right now?" And I said, "Absolutely," because I'm at, I'm at his office on Sunset Boulevard, so I go over. And I meet Ralph Binner, and he said, I'd like you to write two articles for us in Tiger Beat style, and, you know, we'll see if we can use them. Because I had told him about all the people I'd interviewed, but I didn't, I didn't have a resume or anything like that. 
So I worked all weekend. I wrote two stories, one on James Brown, because I had interviewed a lot of the black artists that were playing at the club in South Los Angeles. And I had a wonderful interview with James Brown, mm -hmm. and, um, which wasn't exactly Tiger Beat Fair, but at that point in their history, they were pretty much just rewriting articles from publicists and that sort of thing. There wasn't anybody really going out and doing, you know, real interviews and all that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I submitted that and one on the Dave Clark side, and I poured over Tiger Beat, and I could see, you know, some of the changes. You had to use lots of exclamation points. You had to, you had to bring the reader into the story, you know, and, and what you were experiencing. So mm -hmm. the next Monday, you know, three days later, I drive back up there after my college classes. I turn those in, and, and then Ralph reads them, and he says, would you like to start working here in January? And it was like, yes, I would. <laughs> so I was a paid intern for my last semester of, of junior college, and then, uh, even though I had been accepted at San Jose State because I intended to get a degree in journalism, the publisher had started sending me on tour with Paul Revere and the Raiders, Dino Desi and Billy, um, mm -hmm. and the Standells, and it was like there was no way I was going to go up and live in a dorm room in San Jose, which was you know, not all that ruby a place back then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was no, no, uh, you know, head of tech, you know, at all. And and uh, and so that started my career with Tiger Beat, and it, you know, it turned mm -hmm. out to just be an amazing six years. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked to Coco Dolins, and it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Did you did you meet her before the monkeys or did you meet her after? Oh no! Once the monkeys had gone on TV, then I I flew up to Los Gatos where she lived with the Mickey's family, and I stayed there. I stayed overnight. I I spent one whole day with her. We did like a fashion shoot. We did we shot. Mickey's hometown haunt. So she took me all over Los Gatos, you know, well, this is where he goes to the post office. And this is, you know, and, um, you know, yeah. she was just such a delight. I'm pretty sure her, I think she's a little bit younger than me, but I mean, we hit it off just, you know, yeah, girls in our, in our late teens. And she, she was just such a doll, you know, and who would have ever dreamed she'd end up, singing with the monkey so many years. It was just, you know, that's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we just had the best time, and so that was how I was spending my days. I mean, you just, you couldn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to uh, some of uh, some interviews uh, you did previously. So Michael Nesmith uh, is that bad of a guy? <laughs> uh, only to me. Only to me, and... and Mm -hmm. But he was, I, I remember taking notes on one of the very early times I was trying to do interviews. Because, yeah. because our publisher had bought the rights to do a monthly column in, for each of the monkeys, and we were, we were uh, he also bought the rights to do Tiger Beat's Monkey Spectacular magazine. You know, I, all I had to do was call up, um, you know, their secretary and say, I'd like to come out on this day, this time, and it would be okay. You know, my name would be at the gate. And so I was really going out there a lot because we needed such a volume of, of stuff. Right. And everybody was super cooperative. I mean, you know, Davy and Peter were as sweet as they could be. Mm -hmm. we always, always cooperated, although you had that feeling like he would have loved to have just been goofing around with people on the set more than Right. sitting down and, and talking about himself. I uh, didn't like, I mean, he said to me, he goes, look, I'm married, I'm going to have a kid, and, you know, I just don't have time for this teeny bopper bullshit. 
<laughs> and I was like, uh, well, okay. And, uh, you know, one thing he said to me, oh, you know, I'll see an just screw me. And, uh, and I was like, oh, Michael. But well, I, just, I just learned that he was going to be a problem yeah. for what I need, needed to accomplish. But I didn't dislike him or anything. And um, so the times he would cooperate, he would be his usual, just kind of pedantic, uh, you know, kind of curmudgeonly self. And so he, he'd write funny things down. He'd say funny things. He, you know, he was always, I think that made it a little more palatable for him. Yeah. The best thing he did, he says, why don't you just go interview my wife? She'll tell you whatever you want to know, and I don't, I don't want to deal with this. And it was like, okay. So from that point on, I would have lunch with Phyllis Nesmith once every couple months. We'd go to the Bistro Garden in Beverly Hills, and we'd meet there. And, I mean, we were like the same age, and she was just the most lovely woman. And... Not only would she give me these fabulous stories, you know, about how they met, how, you know, what they were doing for Christmas presents and how they felt about that, and, mm -hmm. you know, for Christian and, uh, you know, it's like whatever the story was, she was there to, to give me the real story. And it just ter turned out, to my mind, I think they got 10 times more information about Mike Nesman that they ever would of me just talking to him. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, it all turned out for the best. Um, what I was surprised with was in 2014 when the monkeys came four miles from my house, yeah. and I had an incredible reunion with Peter Tork, and it was just awesome. Uh, you know, Mike would not talk to me. You know, Andrew Sandoval was doing that tour. That's that's when I first met him. Mm -hmm. And he had arranged for me to sit down with Peter for a half hour. And I said, well, I'd really like to, you know, see Mickey and, and Mike, too, you know. I mean, it's been like, at that point in time, I think it was almost 50 years. Yeah. And, uh, and Mike, it was like, no way. And, and, and in fact, at that show... It might not have been that show. Yeah, I think it was that show. Uh, because I was going in to meet Mickey. Mm -hmm. But on the way in, I ran into Coco, and it was just like, oh, my God. You know, and she, she recognized me, which was super sweet. I mean, you know, 48 years or something had passed. Right. And, um, and we had this great big hug. I didn't see Mike at all. And yeah. so I got the pictures back. I had a girlfriend that was with me that was taking pictures. And mm -hmm. right when I'm hugging this big bear hug with Coco, there's pictures, there's Mike sneaking out the door and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was funny. But and you know, and then the next time he came to town, Peter was scheduled to play. It was just gonna be Peter and Mickey. Right. I think that was 2016, and Peter had to leave for an emergency, a family emergency, but Mike flew in and did the show. Um, I live in Arizona now, so he, he flew yeah. in. And, uh, you know, and the show was fabulous, uh, but like in the afternoon, Andrew just said, hey, they're going to rehearse, because Mike is doing this as a favor, and it was like, oh, I totally understand. And uh, I just, I would love... To have had a reunion just enough to say, you are such a pill to me, you know, why'd you do that? <laughs> but be that as it may, you know. Yeah, it's weird. I, I mean, I always, yeah. I always figured there was something a little, you know, assholeish about him because, you know, he went through periods where he didn't want to be associated with the monkeys. But funny enough, oh, you yeah. know, I heard that when Peter used to do autograph signing shows, he would always be nice to the women, but not so nice to the guys. I, I, I don't know. I never got to meet him. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. I thought Peter was nice to everybody, but you know. 
Yeah. And it's certainly always just wonderful to me. So That's good. You know. Yeah, I know. It made up for my ten times over. <laughs> <laughs> you, he was he was a, a really nice person. You did a lot of uh, traveling in those days. I'm from San Francisco, and I always love to know about, you know, San Francisco and the Flower Power era. What kind of experiences did you have there in those days? Well, that was pretty cool. Um, I had I had met the Jefferson Airplane came to town. Uh, but it was even before Grace Slick was their, their lead singer. It was, mm -hmm. um, I can't remember, uh, Sigourney or... Savigny or something. I can't remember her name, the, the girl that was before Grace. Okay. But anyway, I, I went out with this guy. I met this guy at the Whiskey, um, and he was in a, some small band in Canada, and we became friends. And, um, and he introduced me to Jefferson Airplane. So it's like the next time they came to town, I don't know if he called me or they called me or what, but they were recording. And I went to their recording session, and then, you know, they said, okay, we got to fly up to, you know, after the recording session, we got to fly up back home to San Francisco. And I said, okay, well, I'm happy to drive you to the airport. You know, I had a company car. I, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'll take you to the airport. So, so I, I took um, Spencer and Marty. Um, <laughs> no. Um, Paul Kantner. Paul Kantner, yeah. I, I drove those two to the airport. And so when I'm dropping them, them off, they said, why don't you come with us? And I said, how can I come with you? I'm in a dress. I've got my camera in the car and my purse and anything else. They said, oh, we'll take care of you. Oh, let me call my phone. No idea. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
and they said, oh, tell us about Disneyland. We want to go. And all this, and you're standing there, the remarks that I was about me, you know, and it's like, isn't this the craziest thing in the world? Right. So, but then it's time for them, you know, and Joan Baez came backstage and, and somebody else and they were talking to her. And then, then they went and I, I don't know, I said, do a security guard or something. I said, I'd like to take pictures right down the stage. Okay, right over here. And probably, I don't know, five or maybe even ten feet between the audience and the stage, and, and they couldn't they couldn't go forward any. So I'm standing right below this like six foot stage. It's over my head because I'm five two, mm-hmm. but I've got my telephoto lens on, and so I'm literally right under Mick Jagger whenever he comes to the front of the stage, <laughs> and all of the rest of them are just mere feet away, and I got some amazing pictures, but. Just the experience of that. It was the first time I'd ever seen them. And I mean, there's nobody like Mick Jagger and the Stones. I mean, yeah. they were as different from the Beatles as they could have been. And so it was, there was another totally new experience. So naturally, my mind was blowing and it was, it was really incredible. So <laughs> that, you know, and then the, after that, because Round trip tickets were so cheap. Uh, I would go up there and, and go to the Fillmore Auditorium, and sometimes I'd go with, you know, like with Spencer or something, because he would just be my guide, sort of, because I didn't know anybody. So one time we go to the Fillmore, and, you know, we're backstage with Janis Joplin, and of course, he didn't formally introduce me, you know. Or he might have said, this is my friend Ann. He didn't introduce me as a journalist or anything. And I wasn't like, oh, Janice, I want to interview you, mm-hmm. although I should have. And, and you're, you know, it was just like backstage hanging out with Janice Joplin and all this. And I'm just going, this is, you know, my, I mean, this happened over and over again. <laughs> because I, I never stopped being amazed at some of the people I was around, you know, I mean, yeah. whether it was Tina Turner, uh, and, you know, I wrote an article for Rhythm and News about Tina Turner, and it was just like, wow, this is, you know, I was privy to so much, and my only regret is that I didn't make a bigger deal out of getting a picture with some of these people, because I didn't think that was cool yeah. to act like you know, a groupie or something. So I never did that for that reason, but, you know, I could shoot myself for it today. Speaking, and, of, um, mm-hmm. Speaking of groupies, did you get to know any of the groupies that were around the rock stars? Uh, none specifically. Of course, everybody always talked about the plaster casters. Oh, yeah, Cynthia I plaster never, caster. I, I was, yeah. I never, um, you know, saw them or met them. Uh, and then other than that, it was, you were just aware there were often groupies places. And, but not tons of them would get backstage in the early days. It was just, you know, it was such a yeah. different time. And I don't, you know. Because I inter- I interviewed yeah. the great the greatest rock groupie of all time. Back then she was Pamela Miller. Now she's Pamela DeBar, and she's got great yeah. she's got great stories about um, you know um, hanging out at the um, at the Whiskey a Go Go when she was sixteen and all of that. Oh yeah. Did you did you? Did, I mean, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Did did you go yeah. did you go to any of the famous um, rock festivals like Monterey or Woodstock or Altamont? I was really fortunate to be invited, of course, by Derek Taylor, again, one of the organizers, to go to the Monterey Pop Festival. And I, I went alone, you know, of course, the, the magazine, you know, flew me up to Monterey. And I had, uh, my aunt lived in Monterey. Mm. And so I stayed with her and her partner. 
And so I love seeing her because she was really my favorite aunt. She was like a gourmet cook, and it was really awesome. But every day I would just put on my pea coat because it was cold most of the time. Um, and go out to the fairgrounds, and I'd take a cab to the fairgrounds. I didn't rent a car. And then I just spent the whole day and night, and then late at night I'd take a cab home, which was not an easy thing to do at that point in time because it's not like cabs were hanging around the, you know, the fairgrounds. But I managed it. But the experience of being literally... They had a whole press section of folding chairs for about the first, I don't know, 20 feet by the, whatever the width of the stage was. And those were just folding chairs. And then everything else was, you know, the audience. And so the stars would come to that area to watch the other stars on stage. You know, it'd be like Brian Jones from The Stone. Mm -hmm. He's sitting and watching Peter Tork you know, introduce, uh, who did he introduce? Uh, uh, it wasn't, I think it was Buffalo Springfield back then. I think they were still Buffalo Springfield. Right. Anyway, it, it was just, I loved every, I mean, seeing Otis Redding, I'd never seen him. Oh my God, that was so awesome. And of course I'd seen The Who before. Yeah. But they pulled out all the stops that night and then, Standing there taking pictures of Jimi Hendrix lighting his guitar on fire. <laughs> oh, it just, it just, it couldn't be beat. I mean, I, the only one I didn't like was Ravi Shankar. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't into that. And I think he was on late one night, so I might have, I might have left for that. But it was, you know, that was, it was Three days without incident of just nonstop amazing music. And, I mean, we were really fortunate. I'm glad I wasn't at Altmont. That would have been yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. And, yeah, I would have loved to have been invited to Woodstock with one of the groups that were flying out. But nobody, nobody thought to call me, so I didn't really <laughs> hear about Woodstock until... It was happening or it was over and, and I saw the movie and everything, but, you know, I was fortunate to, to get that Monterey experience because it was just, you know, the mamas and the papa. There were just so many amazing groups on there. Yeah, my dad saw the Rolling Stones in 66 at the Cow Palace, and uh, uh -huh. Neil Diamond got booed off the stage because he wasn't rock and roll, and then Jefferson Airplane came on, and then all the hippies were dancing. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I forgot that Neil Diamond was on. I had interviewed him very early on when he first, when Cherry Cherry first came out. Yeah. He was playing at, a, I think he was playing at the Hullabaloo Club in, in Hollywood, and I did a wonderful interview with him. He was so young and so nervous. He was this little shy boy, I don't know, from Brooklyn or something. I can't remember where he was from. Uh, and he was just, I mean, he, he was a non-star at that point. He was like this singer-musician that, you know, had had one hit record. Yeah. And, you know, neither one of us had any idea where he was going to go. But he was just, he was shy and and very self-effacing, humble, you know, you just, and I don't know where that article ever appeared, because I can't find it. It's one of my, oh. my missing articles. I also interviewed little Stevie Wonder, oh. and he was still li little Stevie Wonder. He was like 13. Yeah. He was, he, was, he was in the same hotel as James Brown. I'd been up to interview James Brown. He was staying in the same hotel, the International on Sunset. And, you know, his manager was there, and I was introduced to him. He was sitting at, like, a keyboard thing, and it was a wonderful interview. He was so sweet, and oh. I don't know whatever happened to that article. I just, to this, you know, I put it, I put posts on Facebook and say, you know, find the missing, you know, Stevie Wonder article. Because I, I figured, you know, in this day and age, somebody could. 
but all of the searching I've done, and I kept most everything else, but I don't have either of those. And it's like, man, that is just a shame. Yeah, maybe you'll find it someday, though. I hope so. Did you ever meet John? Did you ever meet Johnny Rivers? I didn't really meet him, but I did see him at the Whiskey, and I'm telling you, that was one of my favorite shows of all time. Yeah, he pioneered. He he pioneered the live album. He did like six live albums at the Whiskey, and they're all great. And and to be in that audience, it's like you just weren't expecting it, though. You weren't expecting. Mm-hmm. that his kind of music or whatever it was would be so captivating, but it was. I mean, he just commanded the show, commanded the stage. Everybody in the room, you know, loved it. And I was just so happy that I had had that experience because, you know, I mean, it's not like he was a teen idol. So it wouldn't have been something that I said, oh, we've got to get this for the magazine. Yeah. It was just on kind of one of my free nights that I happened to see him, and, oh, I, you know, I wish, I wish there were a video of one of those appearances, you know, with one of those live albums, so that everybody could see what it was like when he performed, because he was really good. Yeah. A couple of months ago, I heard you on the Cow Sills podcast. I've interviewed Bob. He's such oh. a, he's such a great guy, and oh yeah, I just love how you were very kind and regretful of the fact that they never got to be on the cover of Tiger Beat. But what was the reason for that? Um, well, to tell you the truth, mm-hmm. you know they were they were popular. I I don't know if you could say they became teen idol. Yeah. I, I, I think I think the problem was I really think their parents should have invested in braces for them. <laughs> they 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 were a nice looking family, but I mean I know that sounds really shallow, mm-hmm. but you know I mean Peter Tork had one of his teeth fixed. You, you just you know looking at them it was like get me to an orthodontist. <laughs> <laughs> They just would have been so much better looking if they hadn't had crooked teeth. Um, you know, it looked kind of cute on Susan. Yeah. You know, but she was like eight years old at the time, and it was cute. But, uh, you know, so they weren't they weren't your classic, you know, teen idol hunks. Right. You know, they made wonderful music. They were really good to see. Well, I'm trying to think if I saw them in person. I don't think I ever did. You know, I went and interviewed them several times, and I don't think I ever saw them live, though. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm going to have to catch them on an oldies tour. Oh, yeah. God, I... Because <laughs> I, I love their music. I do, too. They have a new album that they're working on. I'm trying to get Susan on here, mm-hmm. and hopefully I'll get to talk to her. Uh, tell me about... Oh, yeah, she's a doll. Yeah, she seems like it. Tell, tell me about uh, David Cassidy. I always got the feeling that he wanted to be taken seriously as a musician, but I think the, the Partridge family kind of limited him. Uh, that's, that's how it turned out. You know, when he was really first starting, mm-hmm. at all he... This is, this is my personal viewpoint, you right. know, of having spent a couple of years with him and everything. In, in the early days, when, when he was first appearing on making TV appearances and when he first got on the Partridge family, it was his ambition to be an actor like his father. Mm -hmm. And it it seemed at the time that the music was secondary, that that wasn't the primary thing in his life. But then when he became, you know, a worldwide phenomenon as David Cassidy, the singer from the Partridge family, Then I think his idea began to change. Well, and combine that with the fact that when the Partridge family ended, nobody was interested in David Cassidy, the actor. And I think those two things combined just had him on the path that he was going to continue because, I mean, he was ultra successful. 
you know, I, I don't know if he was happy during that time because they they literally worked the kid to death. Yeah. But that's when the music became more important and the acting became secondary. And I don't know if he... <laughs> If that changed when he appeared on Broadway or whatever, you know, because I personally didn't have contact with him after 72. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've been told that he really liked appearing on Broadway and all that um, and concentrating on his music over the years. But um, just just not in the early days. But, but during those days, he was extremely frustrated that that, you know, some of the songs they were churning out, he was not proud of, let's say. Mm hmm Wow. So in 1972, you leave Tiger Beat. What was the reason you left Tiger Beat? Well, I, we had recently moved our offices from Highland, which I think the, the, like the Kodak Theater or something is there right now, with 1800 North Highland. And we moved to Hollywood Boulevard right across the street from Grauman's Chinese. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had a, my picture window on Hollywood Boulevard, and we all got new offices, and we got to choose our wall color and, and the color of our carpet, and this was so exciting. And, of course, I had no intention of leaving Tiger Beat. And, um, and then my boss, Ralph Binner, the executive director, Mm -hmm. and the editorial director, he got a new desk and he asked me if I was like his desk, which was a big wooden desk compared to my little, you know, whatever those particle board kind of, you know, laminated desks or whatever they were. You know, and now I had a real neat wood desk and it was bigger. Mm -hmm. And so I they moved the desk into my office, and I'm going through the drawers to move my stuff, and in his top left drawer is a list of everyone in the company and their salaries, or the editorial end. Mm -hmm. And I see that they're paying the male editor of the very new and not yet in the, in the black by any means, Rona Barrett's Hollywood magazine. Yeah. And they were paying them twice what they were paying me. And I just, I had a total fit. I just don't, they don't appreciate me. I've worked my butt off. How can they do this? And, you know, the, the sad part of the story is that my husband of the time that I had married in 1969, we had met working together at Disneyland. Uh, he did not like my so-called, this definitely, quote mark, celebrity. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a celebrity to me, but he didn't like me going to cocktail parties for record releases and all this stuff. Yeah, you know, he was basically, he was jealous. Right. He had a, a job that was $400 a month doing artwork and you know i was making twelve hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. and and that was pretty good in 72. it was more than my dad made as a manager of a bank for 25 years and then i see they're paying this guy twenty four hundred dollars a month so the next morning so he says okay you've got to leave you've got to quit let's move out of hollywood you know which was his dream not mine but uh you know, he, he took advantage of the situation. I went in to talk to Ralph, and Ralph was kind of stammering, and he goes, but, but he's a man, and he's got a kid and a wife. And I said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I've worked for you for six years. I built Tiger Beat right along with you. How dare you? And he said, we don't want you to leave. You're, you do a great job. We'll double your salary instantly. You know, we'll give you whatever, you know, they always said whatever car I wanted, they would lease for me. But anyway, uh, it just, it was, a you know, one little turn of events after another that kind of turned into the perfect storm. And so I left a couple of months after that. And, uh, 
and then I never went back to it, which is, you know, really sad. I mean, it was, you know, the next eight years of my life were just kind of existing. They weren't, you know, I stayed married. I wasn't truly happy, but as anybody who's been through something similar knows, you just don't realize that you're not living your life because you're just busy living it and getting through day to day. And, you know, it took me a long time to wake up, but I woke up in 79 and then got divorced, met somebody else a year later and have been married for 41 years and have two wonderful sons. So oh, congratulations. Like I got the, the, I got the sweet end of the deal. Oh, you sure did. Pay my dues a little bit. Yeah, oh, you sure did. What do you think now uh, that we have we have the internet and magazines don't quite have the the same impact that they used to? Well, uh, you know, in a way, I think it's kind of sad because yeah. I was always a mag I was always a magazine person, right. and my parents' life magazine would. Um, I, you know, I would at least look at the pictures from cover to cover or when the, their Sunset magazine would come and I'd look through it. And so I, I loved magazines. And in my last two years at Tiger Beat, the thing I loved most since I was older than, than the teen idols of the time, it's like I began just loving the entire production because, you know, I had to lay out every page. I had to lay out where the ads go. I chose, you know, what stories were on the cover and who was on the cover. And and I just love that organizational part of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I became really interested in trying to learn about marketing the magazine and getting it on more newsstands and all this. But, of course, that all came to an end when, when I quit. And, um, and so, well, I, I mean, you know, I'm so grateful for the internet now mm-hmm. that, that all, I can communicate with all of the people who read Tiger Beat back in the day. I mean, that's the most amazing thing in the world to me. And, and to find out that they appreciated Tiger Beat and they saved up their, you know, their allowance to buy Tiger Beat. And it's just, you know, it's like, these are things I never knew at the time, of course. And so, um, and so, you know, kind of the death of magazines are sad, but right. it's, it's our exposure to information and news and certainly about celebrities is, you know, it's 24 seven. If that's what you choose, you know, if you want to follow your, your fave, I mean, there's no, there's nothing stopping you now, unless unless it's maybe kids' parents. But I mean, yeah. they they've just got the whole wide world open to them. That's that's just so the, you, you can't you can't knock that. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing how you did it because. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your your economic situation was at home, but that's just amazing how you know you self started and and you know went on this this amazing journey. Well, it turned out to be an amazing journey, and and you know we were we were the most middle class average family, you know, and all my friends, you know, the, my high school friends that I communicate with today, I mean, it was the same for them. I mean, everybody walked outside their house at 9 o'clock and watched the Disneyland fireworks. You know, we were all free to, when your mother would tell you, you know, go out and play, she meant it. She meant, don't come back to this house till dinner time or, or that it's dark. And, and I mean, today kids don't have those freedoms that we had. Yeah. So, so it, it's kind of bittersweet. It was, it was a very innocent childhood go- growing up, but it was also full of things that the kids don't experience today. No. You know, I mean, so, you know, when I wanted to be alone, I would go to the orange grove next door to our house and climb in my favorite orange tree, and it was my private space. I mean, it was just... Uh, 
it was a different time, but, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful for those years. I just think, I think all of us were really fortunate during those years. And, right. you know, to grow up through through the British invasion and all that, and um, it, it really turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote a memoir, uh, Meow, My Groovy Life with Tiger Beats Teen Idols. How long did it take to write? It took five years because I was still working, uh, except for the last year. I worked up until I was 69. So mm -hmm. um, it, um, it, was, it was a challenge. And, and at first I didn't think I could do it. I mean... People would tell me years ago, oh, you know, you should write a book if I mentioned something about my, the old days. And then when the Internet came along and I decided to start a blog mm -hmm. and I, I wrote several stories about my experiences and I just got this great response. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, if I can write those, and my blog posts were long, you know because I, I, I'm always a wordy writer. And I thought, well, if I string 20 of those blog posts together, I would have a book. But I still didn't have the confidence in myself that I could do it, because I thought, I'm just a little magazine writer for a teenage magazine. I can't write a book. <laughs> and um, But then after I you know, put some ideas down and I... Uh, it was quite accidental how I found my editor, and she was the one who helped me to really, you know, decide that I'm going to write it sequentially, you know, by year. Because there are all those decisions, and I mean, I was no book author, so it was like, we did it, and, uh, and it, you know, and I'm very proud of it just because it was a chance to, you know tell people about the behind-the-scenes experience, you know, my love affair with Morris Gibb and, and, uh, and, and then how my life turned out to be better than a Disney fantasy. <laughs> and um, so how's the COVID situation been in Arizona? Oh, people are really stupid here. Yeah. You know, we're... Uh, you know, our our cases are up to five thousand a day. Oh and boy! You're just going. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I I lived in Arizona very briefly in two thousand seven. I had to get out right away. Just the heat, I couldn't take it, and the people there were just. <laughs> oh my God! I thought that the Bay Area people were strange, but no, Arizona stranger. <laughs> <laughs> well, we moved down here with when our son went to school down here, our younger son. Yeah. And and we were we had had we had raised them in Colorado and Colorado without having two young you know snow shovelers in the family was a little more challenging and you know driving to work on a snow day but um, you know it's 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 okay they you know once you get used to heat it's just that that um, once you leave California. It's really hard to come back just because you can't afford to come back once yeah. you're out of that whole Cali California loop of, okay, I bought my house for this much, and I'm selling it for twice as much, and I'm buying a house that costs three times as much. And, you know, once you get out of that cycle, you're, you're almost trapped unless you hit the lottery. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but my brother lives in Laguna Beach, so we often go down there and, and have a little getaway. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> and I saw you post the other day about uh, about the loss of uh, Billy Hinch. Were you close with him? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, we had just had a reunion like a year ago uh, because he asked me to be on his show. And... You know, I talked about the time that, that we were in Hawaii, when I was in Hawaii with, you know, Desi and Biz, Billy, and how Desi and I, Desi, after after the show that one night, he said, you want to go motor, ride on a boat? I'm like, 
with me and I said yeah sure and we get on this motorbike and we're driving on the island and it's dark and we're going by the ocean it's just uh, we're having so much fun and we get pulled over by a cop and it's like what are you kids doing out this late he goes yeah. let me see your ID and and Desi said I don't have anything with me we're staying at such and such a place but, and I said well here's my license and he said well okay you kids are, I don't know if you said you're underage, mm -hmm. but he said, you need to get home right now. If you go right home, I won't bug you. But I mean, Desi was like 15 at the time. Right. Shouldn't have been, I, I don't think he was allowed to drive a motorbike. But anyway, the cop just said, you go back to your hotel, you go back to the house where you're staying, which, you know, he, you know, Desi and Billy had, of course, rented a nice house. And, uh, and so, I mean, and here we were talking about this, and then Desi calls in to Billy's show and tells Desi, I've forgotten about getting stopped by the cop, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, so that, that made me feel good that Desi remembered that, that time. And I mean, and I mean, Billy was the same Billy he was all those years ago. And, and he was just such a sweet man. And... It, this was just so unexpected. Yeah, I was going to meet you know, Billy. I was going to meet Billy last year at the Hollywood show, and then COVID hit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. It's sad, sad, sad. Oh. I found out um, yes. I found out we have uh, mutual friends in uh, John and Lori. Oh, yes. They're wonderful. Yeah, I saw I saw the pictures uh, with with you and them on your um, Facebook page. I was like, oh wow, she knows John and Lori. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. I reached out to Lori a couple of years ago because um, I knew she used to be a waitress at the comedy store, and I wanted to talk about the comedy store because I'm a comedian and stuff. And we became fast friends. Yeah. Uh, she's gotten me a lot of her clients. You know, I go and see her and John when they're at uh, conventions in the Bay Area. I like like last month I saw them and it was so great seeing them after almost two years you know and yeah, yeah they are just wonderful people yeah they are they are and i'm so jealous because they're grandparents but i might be soon so oh yeah on that give it time <laughs> i give give it time my mom wants me to have a kid you know even though she's got three <laughs> she's got three grandkids from my brother she wants me to have one too but i'm, I'm not quite yeah. yeah i'm not quite ready yet though no, we've never put pressure on, but, you know, they brought it up, so I'm running with it. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed. So, Meow, My Life, uh, My Groovy Life with Tiger Beats Teen Idols is available on Amazon. And uh, do you have a website? Yes, it's Ann, A-N-N, Moses, M-O-S-E-S, dot right. com. And you can get autograph books from my website and ebooks and paperbacks from Amazon. I will definitely get one um, when the um, financial situation stabilizes. <laughs> well, Ann, I thank you so much. Are, are we still on the air? Oh, yeah, we're still on the air. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm really happy to send you a copy. Oh, that's so nice. Okay, I'll give you my address um, after I'm okay, done here. Okay, you you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for coming on today and sharing these amazing stories. Um, you have yourself a happy Thanksgiving, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and please stay safe. Oh, you do the same, and I've had a blast talking about it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day, and I'll send you, I'll send, I'll send you my address. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Ann Moses, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a great lady, huh? Great stories about classic rock and roll. Wow, doing acid. <laughs> I loved hearing that story. That was great. I'm going to read the book now. It's awesome. Well, till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes.